This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Pittsburgh to Scranton, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow for the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined by my co-host, as usual, Mara Donnelly. Mara, welcome. Hello, Charlie. So, what's new with you? Oh, well, summer's over, and it's time to get back into the grind of things. It's very yeah. hard to see summer uh, end, isn't it? It's really tough. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and this is a time when we re-engaged and we re-gear for the upcoming uh, year and uh, the end of this year. And one of the things that uh, we're always looking at is new ways to be efficient, new ways to get the most out of our resources. And one of those ways uh, is through public-private partnerships. And to talk about public-private partnerships, we're lucky enough to have uh, Mike Brubaker with us, a former state senator from Lancaster County and who's the chief executive officer for Blackford Ventures. Welcome back to the set, Mike. Well, Charlie and Mara, it's great to be with you. I always enjoy coming back and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that I think is still innovative and it's time we get to the business of building what we call three P's. Well, how can you call something innovative when it's been around forever? That, that's a great <laughs> point. That's a great point. And maybe it's still innovative because there's so few of them, in my opinion, done across the right. country. Uh, but it's a concept that's, that's proven. And this is, uh, and here I am, I'm a private sector person that left private sector, went into state government for eight years, in state senate. Now I'm back in the private sector. So I'm P, private, P, public, P, private. So I'm you're, a three P three myself. Too. <laughs> and so I, I have a little bit of slice of experience of, of the private and the public world. And there's no sense why we can't build a coalition around single themes and co-fund these major projects. Transportation. Pe the PennDOT in Pennsylvania, I think, is doing a very effective job. They have a 3P office. They're eager to hear 3P initiatives. You can go there and explain to them your public-private partnership, how the private sector can invest in a bridge or a road or a toll road. Um, so they're actively doing that now. I'd like to personally like to step up the game and see a lot more of it done. I think one of the issues with government is it's us versus them, and we all know government is not them, government is us, it's we the people. Mm -hmm. So how can we reduce the divide between the people and their government? And I think one of the ways is three Ps, where we're working cooperatively together toward a common goal, co-investing private money with taxpayer money. And I think when you have that direct alignment between private investors and taxpayer investment. I think that's good for everybody. You said you were in the state senate for eight years representing Lancaster County and uh, you did a great job there. But what is that? Thank you. Could you say that again? <laughs> you did a great job there, uh, Mike. But. Uh, you uh, are still in, in uh, close touch with the, the uh, Senate and uh, the staff people up there. What is the awareness in the General Assembly as a whole of 3Ps? Well, it's uh, the reason why I wanted to talk about it today and I'm thrilled to be able to talk about it today is because I think it's just going too slow. I think people don't understand it. I think some people see conflict uh, uh, inside of a uh, a private company that's going to profit on an initiative, there's nothing wrong with profit. Private companies, well, everybody wants a, a more robust employment. Well, how do we grow jobs? You make profitable companies. Absolutely. And, and some people have the, the bizarre mindset that companies should not be profitable. I want companies in Pennsylvania to be highly profitable because what they'll do with a significant portion of that profit is grow the companies, that means grow the employment. And I think to, to do that in cooperation with state government on projects that are unquestionably needed, sewer systems, sewer, underground sewer and water systems, roads, bridges, um, we can, we can co-invest in baseball stadiums and all kinds of things. There's, there's almost no major capital project the state desires to undertake of which a portion of that money couldn't come from the private sector with the right kind 
of deal and, of course, complete transparency. Well, what do you think are some of the risks involved, or why do you think there's a hesitation to not be more in, for the government to not be more involved in public-private partnerships? Um, I think transparency is one. It has to be the process has to be transparent. Matter of fact, I, I have a process to lay on the table, which would be uh, for the governor. And governor, I hope you're watching. Uh, so here's a message to you. Hi, governor. And to, uh, hi, governor. Um, which would be, Governor, uh, what about forming a commission, a public uh, 3P commission? Uh, have some members of the General Assembly, could be House and Senate leadership. Uh, you have to have at least an equal number of people in the private sector, and maybe even have a private sector person chair it. And this commission, public-private uh, public partnership commission, would simply forward recommendations to you, Governor. That's it. So Governor now, is received, as a result of this commission, fully up and active, will be receiving, I hope, 10, 15, 20, really cool looking, economically, economic stimulus kinds of recommendations every month. That'd be cool. Of which the governor and his team at the executive branch, and if he wants to include the, the General Assembly, could vet, that, vet them. The challenge, again, I'm coming out of the General Assembly, the challenge with rank and file members, and any member of the General Assembly, and it's not, it's just a reality. I'm not laying fault at any member of the General Assembly, but what they look at generally is not the state's economic development as a whole. What they look at is their district. Oh. I mean, you can't fault them. That's, what, that's, that's who they're that's representing. Who they're there for, yeah. But you're anticipating my question. You're, you're thinking well, you're ahead of Maren, <laughs> or at least ahead of me, in that we wondered if you've uh, been able to talk to the governor about this and what is the governor's uh, feeling about uh, public private partnerships. Uh, check mark and check mark. Yes, I've spoken to him. Yes, he's, uh, he sees no barrier. I've not talked to him specifically about this new elementary concept I have of a, of, of a commission mm -hmm. made up of equal or even one more private sector person than public sector per persons to develop these partnership recommendations. I've not talked with him specifically about that. I have talked to him about 3Ps as a whole. I congratulated him on the great job that transportation is doing with 3Ps and say, why not, since the state needs more money, and I work, just happen to work for a private equity firm where we have some money. We'd like to invest. We're not the only one. We're one of hundreds of uh, uh, state and national inst private sector institutions <clears throat> that have some cash that would put cash into a joint venture with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. to make it win for us. We'd get a return. It's okay. And the state would get a return. Hmm. I like it. It sounds brilliant, actually. You hear that, <laughs> well, Governor? Brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant. Well, it, you've talked a lot about um, 3Ps in the context of what appear to be more infrastructure related. Um, are there any good examples of states that are successfully doing it? And in addition to infrastructure related projects, is there anything else that the average Pennsylvania might relate to in terms of a 3P? Um, sort of a two, two sure, sure. There. States that are doing it well. There are a few states. I think Wisconsin, Michigan, California, uh, Florida have some. Texas have some programs up and going. I think we can find our own way. I think we we, we can certainly learn through, from them. Mm -hmm. There are national organizations that governors attend. The National Governors right. Association. Mm -hmm. There are national organizations that members of state general assembly attend. That would be uh, CSG and NCSL. So we can learn. And those or, those national organizations mm -hmm. made up of members of state governments, executive and legislative branch, and judicial branches. Uh, we, can, we can extract a lot of learning from them on what other states are doing, what's worked well and what's not worked well. But I think, so a little bit of time invested there would be wise, but I think we don't need to study very much. I think if the commission comes together, as I have recommended, suggested, or a version of that, um, the governor would have, ex could have exclusive authority, if he would so choose, to select which of those initiatives are best for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I don't think it would take him and the leaders of the House and Senate long at all to figure out which ones are really projects that meet with the state's uh, long-term objectives. Would this best be handled by the Department of uh, Community and Economic Development? 
I think it would, Charlie. I think that would be an, I think that'd be ideal, and that'd be a, certainly a, a person that should be on that commission. What about three P projects um, with uh, local government? Um, could you give us some examples of them? Uh, are, is your firm involved with any of uh, 3P projects with local government around the Commonwealth? Uh, we're not currently involved with the 3P with local local governments, but we have something like uh, in excess of 2,000, 2,600, I think it is, local governments in Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of opportunity. I happen, I serve on a number of different boards. One of the boards I serve on is the Lancaster County Solid Waste Management Authority. Mm -hmm. That solid waste management authority gets its money from tipping fees. So when you pay your trash hauler, it ultimately goes in Lancaster County to the solid waste management authority. The solid waste management authority is, a, is an authority, so it's quasi public. But it's invested money, matched local government's money to improve a rail trail. So that's people, private citizens paying their trash hauler, ultimately going into authority, ultimately going to improve the environment, improve. Uh, the walk, walking trails of Lancaster County. Um, so that's certainly an example. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to a basic question. Um, how does a 3P differ from what we see uh, in the manner that government operates right now, which is they put out an RFP for a project and a private company will bid on it and potentially win it or not win it, but they'll be doing some of the work. What's the difference between what's happening right now and what a 3P would be? Because I know a lot of people are probably a, thinking, well, don't, you know, don't companies get state government contracts now? Uh, yes, they do. So that's a great point, Mara. Um, so there it's the government dictating um, and laying out a very specific punch list for a company that's been success successfully bid, and they will build that building or whatever it is exactly to the government specification. Right. So government, 100% government financing, mm -hmm. but through taxpayers' mm -hmm. generous payments to their government, and then a project going forward. Uh, a 3P in the private sector, uh, we call it joint venture. So it's really a joint venture. So, the, so if there's a $10 million project, $5 million, and if the government doesn't have the $10 million, it can't go forward. So here, if the government on a $10 million project would say the government's going to put in $5 million of taxpayer money, and it's looking for a private equity partner, to put in the other five million. Now it's a joint venture. Now we own it together. And my argument is, I think that makes um, uh, a major capital investment for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania better, not worse. Well, because if a private sector is not going to invest, it's not yeah. it's not a wise investment. So so there's got to be some cash flow coming back. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't the state start to think, not on every project, but on many projects, why don't you start thinking a bit more innovative, a bit more entrepreneurial, make sure that these, these concepts are cash flowing, or, or, and if they are, private sector will come running looking to invest. We have pension funds, billions of dollars of money in pensions funds that need to be invested somewhere. Are our pension funds being invested in Pennsylvania-based projects? Very little. Why not? They ought to be. Hmm. Well, it sounds like that brings the private sector in at the outset, and so that their expertise on issues becomes part of the planning and the building of the um, contract or the project more than just being told what to do. That's true. A okay. true joint venture yeah. where the private sector wants, it, wants their government's project to win and, and, and stay and be competitive and be economically viable, as opposed to a citizen sit, sit, uh, sitting back criticizing that project, actually hoping it, it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't work. That's not healthy. We want projects that are long-term economically viable. And when you have the private sector investing, you're going to get that. Yeah. And you're going to get that private sector mindset and intelligence into the project as well. So, Governor Wolf? <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I think we have to wrap things up here for today. But uh, we want to thank you for joining us, Mike. And uh, we want to uh, uh, have you come back soon to let us know what the next project is that Blackford Ventures is working on. So, thanks for being with us. We'll be back with the second part of Behind the Headlines right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions to make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. 
Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. By the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Express, transporting construction, farm, and industrial equipment throughout the United States. And by Blackford Ventures, LLC, a private equity firm seeking to make significant investments in real estate, proven business enterprises, and their leaders. Find out more at www.blackfordventures.com. And by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. For this segment, this exciting new segment, I am joined by Jerry Strittmatter, who is a member of the Board of Directors of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Hi, Maura. Nice to see you. Wonderful to see you again. We're doing something a little bit different today, aren't we? Yes. We, something we've never done here before. We're always we are, high tech. We are high tech. Well, we like to think we are. Of course. <laughs> we are going to uh, use a Skype feed today to uh, bring in a guest. And it is Mr. Dan Simmons from the Institute of Energy Resources, located in Washington, D.C., and he is the Vice President for Policy. So we'd like to say welcome, Dan. Well, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here, and uh, we're going to give you an opportunity first to tell us a little bit about the Institute of Energy Resources. Sure. The, uh, the Institute for Energy Research is a, is a nonprofit located in Washington, D.C., and also Houston, Texas. And what you know what 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 we promote what we talk about is energy that energy is the lifeblood of the economy we believe for example that that the freer markets in energy lead to better outcomes that it leads to lower energy prices which is good for everybody and actually it, it also uh leads to better environmental outcomes so that's why that's that's why we promote free markets in energy and that is the that is the reason that the institute for energy research exists and as the director of policy, what exactly do you focus on in your day-to-day -day existence? Day-to-day, uh, -day, what uh, what I work on is, uh, you know, first of all, making sure that everything that goes out is uh, is uh, it, 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 it's good and not containing errors. That's that's Accurate. my number one job. But the <laughs> second thing that we do is the second thing that uh, that in my job, what I do is just trying to promote the the, the products that we put out. For example, uh, a recent uh, recent paper that we uh, that we released is on the, the the true cost of electricity because one of the real challenges that we have today is okay, you know how much does electricity cost from various sources because you know it isn't like uh, you know it isn't like maybe the gas station or something where you see the price all the time. Maybe once a month you see the price of electricity when you actually open your electricity bill. And I know that I don't even look at the price of electricity then. So, no. uh, you know, just talking about the price of electricity because it is it is critical to a uh, you know to to getting the economy growing again. There's been a lot of a lot of misinformation, especially when it comes to coal and the low price and the and the safety features that we have and and how how uh, all the new technology has already improved the delivery of coal and the energy. Can you tell us a little bit about that and about Pennsylvania's? Uh, uh, place in the world energy market because of coal? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania is, uh, you know, I, I think maybe in the past people uh, thought of Pennsylvania as a as an energy powerhouse and uh, ener and and then uh, coal production has decreased some in Pennsylvania. But the reality is, is that Pennsylvania has vast energy resources. The first, you know, the first, obviously, the first uh, oil well in the U.S. was drilled in Pennsylvania, which I think is pretty cool. Yes. The, uh, you know, we now have the natural gas boom that's going on because of hydraulic fracturing in, in Pennsylvania, and that is wonderful. And Pennsylvania has very large coal resources. In the past, people have thought of coal as a, you know, as, as a dirty resource. But the reality is, is that, Coal is only dirty if you're not implying today's uh, technology to 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 burn it and to use it in power plants. And the uh, you know one of one of the statistics that I like the most is since 1970 to today, our total use of coal increased by about 80 percent. However, total pollution emissions decreased by 70 percent. So. Over that time, from 1970 to today, you know we're driving more miles. The population has increased in the United States. We're using more energy of all types, and we're using more coal. 
and pollution is down. So, you know, people that are concerned that pol the coal equals pollution, um, you know, that, that, just isn't, that just isn't true anymore because of uh, today's pollution control technologies. Well, I understand that your organization spends a lot of time working on or um, talking about the advantages of using existing resources, um, coal being one of them. But there's a lot of new technologies out there that people are anticipating. Windmills, you know, they're looking for all sorts of um, other ways to generate um, energy. So wh what do you think the comparison is between the new versus the old technologies? Well, you know, the, the, the first thing is, is that, uh, <laughs> that, that windmills aren't necessarily a, a new technology when it comes to energy. We've used windmills for, you know, for, you know, they've generated electricity for over 100 years. Um, and really, when it comes to electricity, one of the most important things is, is the price. Um, and uh, the price of, of electricity generation from our existing sources, such as existing nuclear plants or existing coal, is very inexpensive. It's less than four cents a kilowatt hour, compared to say building uh, new windmills, new wind turbines that cost almost twelve cents a kilowatt hour. So it's it's essentially you know it's it's it is uh, at least three times less expensive to use our existing power plants to generate electricity than building new ones. Well, that's pretty um, significant. So Oh, it is, yeah. it is it is a huge issue, especially when you consider that the, the average price of electricity in the United States is about 12 cents. I think the average price in, in Pennsylvania is about 13 cents a kilowatt hour. So when you're putting in new generation that costs, you know, the, the same as the, the, the cost of electricity, um, because when we see our electricity bill, what we see is the final price. That includes transmission. It includes, you know, all the wires to get it to your house. Um, and there's a lot of additional costs. Um, so the the wholesale price of electricity is generally about three to four cents a kilowatt hour, not twelve cents. So when we were when we were building new power plants that are that cost twelve cents a kilowatt hour, um, that means that we're going to be seeing higher electricity prices um, as we move to uh, you know as we move to uh, you know new new wind power um, power plants, for example. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about new natural gas power plants, and they're great. We, you know, we don't have any problem with them. However, our existing coal-fired power plants are almost uh, half as – the electricity from those power plants are almost half as cheap as building a new natural gas-fired power plant. So the point is, is if we are concerned about the cost, if we want to keep costs low, let's make sure to continue to use the, you know, the, the power plants that we have already built – as opposed to building new ones, because that just means higher prices, and uh, at, that is no way to, to build an economy. Another, another issue would be the transportation of electricity and the fact that you lose so much so that since we're the center of, of coal and you know worldwide leader in energy, it makes more sense to have manufacturing come you know, to where uh, electricity can be transmitted at a shorter distance. So, it would really be hurting us in Pennsylvania, wouldn't it, if, if all of a sudden we relied on energy sources outside of our state? Oh, that is that is 100 percent correct. Uh, you know, it's one of the the United States. People have talked for a long time about how the United States is the uh, some people have called the Boone Pickens, for example, is called the Saudi Arabia of wind power. The problem is that that wind power is in. Uh, you know, it, it's like in a band in the in the in the Midwest from essentially from Texas up to North Dakota. Um, and that's the problem. It's a long way from North Dakota to, to Pennsylvania. And it doesn't make any sense to, uh, to, to, to ship the wind that far. The transmission is just too expensive. Now, there's, there's obviously some better wind resources closer and in Pennsylvania, but it is nothing near as, as good as the wind resources out. You know, the, wind just, the wind blows more on the plains. That's, that's, that's as simple as it is. And so – uh, you're, you're exactly right. One of the one of the benefits of natural gas, one of the benefits of coal, one of the benefits of nuclear is a lot of those power plants are much closer to population centers and closer to manufacturing centers. In fact, obviously, you could build a coal-fired power plant right next to your right next to a uh, manufacturing center, for example. So, um, that is a uh, that is an important consideration as we are uh, talking about you know building new power plants and using the ones that we ex we currently have. 
Well, we know as an organization you have the opportunity to work with local state organizations and you have a good partnership with the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance here in Pennsylvania. And we've had them on the show. We've learned a lot about coal over the last uh, several months. But really, the industry is um, under fire and um, under siege, basically. And there's a lot going on on the federal level that could potentially impact and risk our energy ability here in Pennsylvania, as well as impact that the um, industry as, as a whole. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the partnership with our Coal Alliance and what you're doing about the federal issues? Sure. The, the federal issues in, in particular are, uh, are devastating for the, for the coal industry. It's devastating for low-cost, affordable energy. Um, because of a number of regulations, such as one that is called the uh, cross-state air pollution rule, the mercury air toxic standards, uh, as well as a, a, a regulation that is, uh, you know, well, it's uh, from Section 111D of the of the of the Clean Air Act, something the administration likes to call the Clean Power Plan. Those regulations will shut down 103 gigawatts of coal generating capacity. And the problem is, as I as I previously mentioned, those are low cost uh, power plants, and so. As we have to, you know, to comply with those regulations, as we go forward and you have to build new new power plants, it is going to be more expensive. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see uh, electricity prices increase. For example, there was a study done by the National uh, Economic Research Associates that uh, because of the uh, this 111D rule, as they call it, uh, that electricity prices between 19 or between 2017 and 2033 will increase an average of 14 percent per year. I mean, that is a huge increase. And especially if you were in, if you were using a lot of electricity in your business, um, that is going to be a, it, that's going to be a killer. And it is, it is our future unless that uh, the, the federal government will moderate these, some of these regulations. In, in, in this last uh, minute that you have, Dan, uh, our viewers, the manufacturers, uh, the policymakers in Pennsylvania, in order to you threw out a lot of information to us today, and we'll have to have you back to get more. But where can they get in touch with you uh, to let let you know what's happening here? Like these regulations are impacting manufacturers, and the policymakers have to address that. We're worried about letting China off till 2030 and restricting ourselves, and it makes absolutely no sense. And I'm and people are mad as heck, and they want to make sure that they get the right information. So if you could tell us a little bit about how, how we can get in touch with you. Sure thing. Uh, the, the, the best way is our website, which is the instituteforenergyresearch.org. And also there's a lot of good information on our sister organization's website, the AmericanEnergyAlliance.org. Uh, both, of, both of our organizations, um, you know, th that's what we do, is just talk about these issues, particular, particularly these issues of of affordability of of electricity are just critical because you know the United States we are not going to have low cost labor but we can have low cost energy because we have incredibly abundant energy resources particularly particularly in Pennsylvania natural gas a ton of coal and uh, we could the United States is an energy powerhouse the question is will the federal government let us truly be one well, I think one th a third resource would be the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance website mm -hmm. as well. So we'd like to put that out there. But, Dan, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us via Skype today. Um, we, successful use of technology. So we're very happy to have you, and we hope we can have you back someday. Thanks, Dan. Well, thanks for having me. And we'll see you next week um, on a new edition of Behind the Headlines.